wherever you're watching from, you are welcome to this powerful service. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall be glad and rejoice in Him. So get some space, invite a friend, invite a relative, invite a sibling. Come into your living room or wherever you're watching from, and let's praise the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Are you ready? You're ready. Get your groove on, get your space to get your bounce on. All right. Side to side. Hey, are you ready for this one? Ha! My dear brothers and sisters, step by. Let nothing move you except the beat. Hey, you there without no roots. Are you a backslider? I said, you there without no roots. Are you a backslider? Check it. Let go of Sunday faith. Let go of shallow faith. Let go of divided faith. Let go of stagnant faith. Don't be overconfident. Live on by company. Let go of all your friends and all your disappointments. Hey, my food of worship. We did it again. Yes, sir. We did it again. My food of worship. We did it again. Hey.
have this solid ground. And because he's asking us to give of ourselves, we choose to follow the one and only King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the one who sits on the right hand of the Father. Through and through, we make this promise. Yeah. We make this promise as a people. Lord, if you can hear us, I know you can hear us, oh God. Oh God, be your people. Hey, thought that I could do it, thought that I could make it, thought that I could build it on my own. But I've come to see that. But I've come to see that as I've tried to fill the void, nothing else can fill the hole. Today, tomorrow, forever, Lord. 
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you're watching from. Welcome to Mavuno Church. We're so delighted that you can worship with us today. My name is Pastor M. Omuridi Wanjao, Senior Pastor of Mavuno. And it's my delight to welcome you into this time of worship. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in an amazing time uh, of just ex enjoying God's presence. And what an incredible uh, uh, time because we're also learning this whole month. Uh, our series is about worship. So it's, I, I hope it's even more special for you as we worship God together. Hey, I want to just welcome all of you who are first-time visitors. You've never been to Mavuno Church before. Uh, so, so welcome. We're so delighted that you dropped by. And we want to ask you to feel at home. If you could ev uh, even just fill out that little, uh, there's, a, there's a link on your screen. Uh, if you could just uh, link to that and fill that out for us. We would love to send you a welcome uh, note and just to say thank you for visiting uh, with us in a special way. And also, if you would like to join an online uh, discipleship community, discipleship group, uh, please also, you can use that same link. And we would love to connect with other people uh, who are passionate about Jesus, who are passionate about growing in their faith, becoming everything God wants them to be. Hey, I uh, want to just pray for us uh, as we give our tithes and our offerings as well. Uh, we, one of the things that we do when we worship is we also worship God with our resources. And, uh, and, and I know that every time we do that, I mean, what we are doing is acknowledging. Every time I worship God with my resources, uh, whenever I give my tithes, when I give my offerings, what I'm doing is acknowledging that it all came from Him, that none of it belongs to me, that it's all His. And what I'm doing as I give a portion back is I'm saying, Lord, I commit this to you in, a, in, accordance, in accordance to your word because I'm doing it in obedience. And as I do that, I'm trusting you that you will cover the rest. There's a way that that portion sanctifies the rest of my, of my resource. And that, it'll, that, Lord, I'm trusting you that the part that I'm left with, you will multiply to do everything that I need to do in my purpose. And so I want to just uh, pray for us as we give and also prepare our hearts for God's word. Father, thank you so much for this day and thank you for the opportunity to worship you. Thank you for the opportunity to give our tithes and our offerings I pray that, Lord, as we do so, that you would bless every family represented here. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would increase us, you would multiply us, you would give us the ability to even understand how to manage wealth your way. And as we do, Lord, I pray that you would cause us to have the, the strength uh, economically and financially to be a blessing, not just to our own families, but to the world around us. I pray for anyone who's looking for a job, anyone who's in that place where they are trusting you for financial breakthrough, that, Lord, even as we give out of faith, that, Lord, you would come through, you would intervene in our situations and supernaturally lift us up. And I pray that, Lord, everyone here will have a testimony of God's goodness and God's provision. And so I bless you, God's people. And even now as we uh, re receive your word, Lord, speak to us, every single one of us. Open our hearts and our ears that we may hear exactly what you want us to hear. For we pray in Jesus' name, God's people say it. Amen. Hey, I want to start with a question today. What is one thing you learned to do during the pandemic that you still enjoy doing today? Like what's one thing that you learned to do during the pandemic that you still enjoy doing today? So I, this question is, is a great one. Some of the answers I got to the question were really, were really fun. Apart from sleep, <laughs> which a lot of people learned to sleep really well because they didn't know how to do that before. But meetings was one of them. I mean, isn't it nice not to have to travel to meetings, but you can do them from home? I mean, it's so nice that you can even have family meetings where your family is all spread out in different countries and your parents even know how to use Zoom. Come on, somebody. I mean, it's just been such a revolution that you can meet from wherever you are, whether it's an office meeting or a friendship meeting without constraints of having to be in, a, in one space. Uh, the technology just kind of zoomed up for that, uh, pun intended. Uh, E-commerce is another one. Don't get me started on the convenience of shopping from home. I mean, in this country, you can shop for practically anything online and have it delivered to your house. Uh, what an amazing revolution. That's so awesome to live in such days. And then work. Uh, many people now are able to work remotely, which means then you don't have to commute from work. Uh, you don't have to commute to work uh, in traffic like two hours or three hours every day for many people. And then you can also work from practically anywhere. And so you can be on the beach somewhere. Come on, I see you there. Uh, another one was online classes. Uh, nowadays, you can enroll for and do a master class on practically any subject online. That, that whole area just blew up as well. And you can do it at the convenience of your own home and even of your own time. So people really talked about some of these. One of the ones that really was, uh, was a good one was online church. Uh, people who live in places where they couldn't worship with others now can access worship services. And I'm really excited about all of you who are part of our online service. We have people watching from 
amazing countries all over the world. Some countries where they don't even have churches uh, legally, but you're able to watch just because of online church. I'm so grateful for the technology that causes us to worship together. Now, with all these conveniences, it's completely clear that the world has changed forever and that the future is virtual. Uh, many companies are racing for those AI solutions, those virtual reality solutions, and it makes it for a very efficient and convenient world. Truth be told, most people were affected when it came to physical church attendance for many, many people. And it's so much more convenient to catch church, the Sunday service, uh, from your couch on a Sunday morning. I mean, think about it, you're still in your PJs, uh, you, you can sleep in and then wake up for just five minutes before church. Come on, somebody. Uh, or maybe even five minutes after it starts. <laughs> and, and the thing is, because you can even watch the service hours after it premiered, so that you can watch the bits you like and skip the rest. You know, it's like Netflix. It's so convenient, you know. But here's the thing. With all that convenience, are there some dangers that have come up with that? And that's kind of what I want us to explore today. For our visitors, we're going through this series called Wired for This. How worship can change your reality. And we're learning from the life of King David, one of the Bible's most prolific uh, musicians and songwriters. And in our first week, we learned that all of us need to worship God because what you choose to magnify will eventually control you. We also learned that worship is a powerful tool for spiritual warfare. And the thing we learned in that week was that your worship is your weapon. And then last week, we learned that worship keeps us from giving up when the going gets tough. And we said, worship strengthens your faith. And so today, we want to explore yet another truth about worship. And the title of my message, hmm, you're going to like this one. Worship defeats idolatry. Worship defeats idolatry. I want you to turn with me to 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 1 to 4. 1 Chronicles 17, verse 1 to 4. And here's what it says. After David was settled in his palace, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. Nathan replied to David, Whatever you have in mind, do it, for God is with you. But that night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, This is what the Lord says, You are not the one to build me a house to dwell in. Now, this is a long way from the cave. Uh, David, last we saw him, was hiding in a cave with people wanting to destroy him. This story happens many years later. And David had been a fugitive. I mean, David was actually a fugitive for about 15 years. From the time he was anointed, almost from the time he was anointed, very soon after that, to when he turned 30. And at that point, King Saul died and David took over as king of Israel. And then it took him another seven years to win the civil war that ensued so that he could finally rule over all of Israel. So think about that. Imagine waiting for 22 years for the promises of God to be fulfilled in your life. That's exactly what happened. It's like God told him this is going to happen, but then it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and eventually, after a long time, it happened. And the thing I, I, I commend about David and I, and I admire about him is that he still trusted God every step of the way, even when the, deni the, the, the delay felt like a denial. I don't know if you've ever been in that place. And, and, and no wonder then the Bible calls him the man after God's heart. So today we want to just continue on when David became king. And by this time, things were good. He was no longer in trouble. He had fought off all of Israel's enemies, brought peace and stability and prosperity to the nation of Israel. He's built a great palace of, to, for himself made out of the finest wood. And, it's, and, and he set up Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And in the middle of that, the Bible tells us God established him and exalted his kingdom. So he's, he's really, things are going well. You know, last week we looked at what happens when things are going really badly. Here, things were going really well for David. And with all that success, you would almost imagine that David would now just be like relaxed, satisfied, and settled. But far from being satisfied, David's heart was not at peace. There was something that was still bothering him. He was agitated that he lived in this glorious palace. And yet the ark of God was stationed in a tent. And you know, the ark of God was this gold encrusted wooden chest that contained, among other things, the tablets of the law that Moses had brought down from the mountain and given to the Israelites years ago. It represented the dwelling of God's presence among God's people. And, and David looked at that and he said, no, I need to build God a, a, a worthy house. I need a temple where people can all gather corporately to worship God. Now, 
As you read, God did not agree to David's request, but he instructed that instead, David's son, Solomon, would be the one to build a temple. And I bet you that was disappointing for uh, King David. Uh, but despite that, David was undeterred. And you know what he does next? I mean, the guy, first of all, just spends a lot of time coming up with detailed plans for it. He's like, I may not be the one to build it, but I'm a, I'm a planet. I want to make sure it happens uh, the way it's supposed to happen. And then he raised a lot of money. Uh, he put up all these resources to build it. So he told his son Solomon, you're the one privileged to build it, but I'm going to fund it. And the reason he was like this is because he was so committed that God's house would be built and that God's people would have a place to worship the Lord together. Now, this, this desire that he had for corporate worship, it's all over the Psalms. In Psalm 122 verse 1, he says, I was glad when they say to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I mean, it's like, man, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm so happy when they tell me to come to church. In Psalm 34 verse 4, he says, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. He's like, yes, I'm worshiping God, but I want people to worship God with me. Uh, in Psalm 84, one of the most heartfelt and beautiful Psalms, he wrote, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. He was talking about the place where God's presence is, uh, the place where God's people worship him. He says, my soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My flesh, my heart and my flesh, my flesh cry out for the living God. It's like, man, I can't wait to go and worship God. I can't wait to go to the place where God is worshipped. And then in verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are forever praising you. It's like, man, I wish I was even one of those priests. I wish I was one of those guys who lived near church. I wish I could just be going there anytime I wanted to because those people are always praising you. And then in verse 10, he declares, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Now, why was David so passionate about creating this space where people would come together and worship? Why is he so passionate that people would gather? He would gather with others to worship God regularly. One of the hallmarks of our times that defines not just our personal lives, but also our journey of faith is something that we call consumerism. Now, consumer Christianity places our needs and our desires at the center of our experience. So what does that mean? I mean a, a, a consumer culture is that convenience culture. We pick and choose what we want, when we want, and how it works best for us. And when it comes to faith, we're often tempted to act exactly the same way. I mean, I want to listen to the preachers that I prefer. I want to listen to the topics and the sermon series I enjoy. I want to listen and worship God with the songs that do it for me. In a way, my faith becomes curated into a, a Spotify playlist. And it's like I listen to what I want, when I want, how I want to listen to it. Now, let me say this. Having said that, I suspect we're all guilty at some point or the other uh, on this spectrum. And I'm certainly not exempt. Uh, wanting church to be convenient, to meet my needs. I mean, I'm one of those kids that grew up in church and slept a lot of that time. And so wanting a church that I don't fall asleep in, that's very important for me, you know. But, but the internet has kind of accelerated that for us because it's made the process so much easier today. And the danger is that with consumer Christianity, God moves from the center and I become the center. Instead of what does God want, it becomes what do I like? What do I enjoy? It's about what, what, what they call, what, what happens? I don't know if you know what happens when I become the center of worship and God moves away from the center. The actual word for that is idolatry. That's what the Bible calls it. And that's the danger of consumer-centered centered worship. Uh, when I become a, a, a Christian who's about what I enjoy as opposed to what God enjoys. And that's why, that's why corporate worship is so important for us. That's why it's so important that we worship with others, not just by ourselves in the house. When we can, I know there's some of you who might be in a country, a war-torn country, or you might be in a country that is not Christian and does not, that frowns and past Christians are persecuted. That's a completely different picture. But even in those places, it still behooves you to find other believers that you can worship in. And I know that there are many places, I know people in different countries where they come together secretly to worship God because they understand the power of corporate worship. I mean, think about it. David, of all people, is the guy who should have stayed home the most. Uh, if anybody should have stayed home to worship God, David was the expert worshiper. He wrote, like they, the scholars say, he probably wrote up to 4,000 songs. So the ones in the Psalms are just a sampling. It's like his playlist would be, like think about how many musicians do you know who have written 4,000 songs today? I mean, this guy was, he was a worship leader. His, his music could pacify demons. So, I mean, that's a guy who should have stayed home and said, my, why am I even going to listen to some funny worship team? 
I mean, I can, I can play the music by myself, you know? Uh, and, but, but, if the, but he knew, he knew, watch this, he knew that something powerful happens when God's people worship together. There's, there's something corporate worship does. It delivers me from myself. It delivers me from my preferences. It allows God to be the one to lead me in the way he desires. It moves me from the place where I'm at the center and puts God at the center. I'm no longer in charge. God is. It's no longer my desires or my preferences that rule the day. In other words, here's the thing I've been trying to say. Corporate worship defeats idolatry. Something really powerful. When I come to church, it's not about me. I'm not in charge. And it's like I'm part of a community and God moves in that community in a way that honors him. So, so let me give you an example. Imagine being invited to meet Elon Musk or some other billionaire in their place. And he actually comes to pick you up from your house. And then you find that instead of driving a Tesla, like you thought he would be, he's driving a Toyota Vitz. And, and he, he's on driving, by the way. He's in the front and he invites you to come and sit next to him. And imagine being so unhappy. Like, how can he pick me up in a Toyota Vitz? Is that like, is that like what he thinks I'm worth? And you get so, unf- so fed up and so unhappy that you completely are not even able to communicate with him. You're not even able to have a conversation. Wouldn't that be a foolish thing? You'd be so foolish. Why? Because you need to understand that the car is just a vessel to convey you to the conversation that you really need to have with this guy who could actually change your life. And it's the same thing when it comes to worship. You know, many times we focus on the great singers or the great band and, 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 and the great preacher, worship leader, and we forget that these are just vessels. That actually what is really important is the relationship, the connection of the community of God's people with God. And so we, we, when we come and we're thinking about, oh, I like this church because it has this music, or I like this, this guy because of how he leads, what we're doing is we're focusing on the vessel as opposed to the person we should be having the conversation with. And, and it's so important for us to understand that when we gather to worship, we are cured of that desire to worship ourselves. We're cured of that desire to engage God on our terms because that's what corporate worship is meant to do for us. It's meant to cure us from our idolatry. No wonder David said, I rejoiced when they said to me, I mean, this guy has just been writing songs at home. He's been chasing demons with his songs. But I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You see, worship is not about me enjoying myself. It's about me bringing joy to God's heart. Come on, somebody. Yeah. When it comes to worship, it can sometimes feel like the worship team are the performers and we as a congregation are the audience. But actually, that's getting it all twisted. We are all the performers. We are all the the act. There's only one audience, and that audience is the God of heaven. Tell your neighbor for me, you're not the audience. You're not the audience. Don't get it twisted. You see, my worship must be passionate regardless of who is leading, regardless of what songs they're singing. Whether it's the most gifted, international, uh, serious, anointed uh, worship pastor, or whether it's a small village band led by a man singing off-key. It doesn't matter. You see, my passion should not be determined by the vessel, by the external things. And that's the beauty of corporate worship, that it's no longer about me leading myself, curating for myself what kind of worship I want. When we gather together, we put our preferences aside. We come God before God on his own terms because corporate worship defeats idolatry. So, so what does this mean for us? Maybe I can, I can just begin to give the land this plane and just talk about uh, what it means for us in the place of corporate worship. Now, next week, we're going to be uh, doing a, a special service. We're going to have a lot of worship in that service. We're going to be debriefing the service with some amazing uh, worship pastors. And so that's going to be really, really amazing. But you know what? I want to just conclude this sermon by just saying uh, a couple of places we can begin to apply the things we've learned today. Number one, when it comes to corporate worship, Come on time. Come on time. You know, coming on time shows that you esteem God's presence. If, if our, millionaire, our billionaire friend invited you for a meeting, my suspicion is you would, most of us would sleep very early so that you can wake up fully fresh, fully prepared to listen to every word and take advantage of every situation. And yet many times we show up late every week for an encounter with the creator of the universe the maker of all billionaires. You know, if you had an employee that showed up late for a meeting every time, how would you feel about them? I suspect your heart posture towards them might even change because it's clear they don't esteem you. And here's the thing, even on, in our places of work every day, uh, whether we are tired or not, whether it rained or not, we strive to be on time. When we're taking our kids to school, we work hard to make sure that none of them is late to get to the place of education. Why? Because we value what they're getting, what we're getting in these places. Listen, if you value God's presence, 
uh, if you value, you want to teach your children to honor God's presence, then you must show at least the same respect that you show to the school when it comes to God's presence. Plan when you come to church to, to be on time. I really want to commend uh, this practice to you. Number two, what's the second thing we learn? Is that we learn to, we must worship with passion. Worship with passion. What do I mean? Imagine with me that you're dating someone. But whenever you speak to them, their hands are always folded. They have a sneer on their face and a look that kind of says, impress me. And, 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 and you know, if you, if you talk to them and complain about it, they tell you, no, I'm not bored. I'm, I'm very happy on the inside. It, it doesn't show, but I really like you and it's just on the inside. How would you feel about that person? It's like, my goodness, you'd feel like you're wasting your time. Like if you're, if you're happy about me, show it. I need to show it, see it on your face. If someone comes to you, when they see you, their face brightens, they, they come up with a warm smile, they give you a hug. You know, your posture even changes because you believe them when they say they actually enjoy your presence. Now, and, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's the same when we come to God. Our outward posture expresses our inward reality. Whether it's learning to sing with passion, to raise our hands, to kneel, to dance, uh, to shout in praise, these things actually, the outward expressions have a very uh, powerful, uh, ex it's an expression of the posture of our hearts. And David models this for us because David, uh, he talks about this all the time. Psalm 143 verse 6, he says, I spread out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. It's like I worship God with my hands stretched. It's like God, look at me. And then at times he even bows his knees when he's thinking about God's love for him. Psalm 5 verse 7, he says, but I, by your great love, can come into your house in reverence. I bow down to your holy temple. I mean, he's a whole king. He's used to people bowing to him. But when he says, when I come before God, I'm the one who bows. It doesn't matter whether you're a CEO. When you come before God, you're the one who bows. And then he doesn't sing to God politely. He cries out for help. He says, Psalm 77 verse 1, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. I mean, he's not like being, oh God, I'm so cool. You know what? Uh, help me if you can. He's like, I'm crying out to God. Somebody needs to be crying out to God when we are worshiping. Uh, David even clapped his hands when he was singing. Psalm 47 verse 1, clap your hands. All you nations, shout to God with shouts of joy. I mean, this is a king talking and he's talking to other nations. So he's not even afraid to worship in public. That's what this is saying. And then sing, uh, speaking of shouting, he, he taught us to, to shout and sing gladly. Psalm 100 verse 1 to 3 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. Come on, worship the Lord with passion, people. That's what David is teaching us. So number one, come on time. Number two, worship with passion. Number three, final one, prepare for an encounter. Prepare for an encounter. You know, some Christians complain. I just don't seem to get anything from the church service. In fact, I get so much more when I'm alone at home. But you know, it may be true, but the, the thing is, most times when believers express these kinds of sentiments, it's because we don't personally prepare ourselves for worship. We think we can just kind of haphazardly enter a worship service and assume it's going to be engaging because, I mean, if God is there, it should be engaging. And we assume that it's our leader's job to give us a good worship experience. Uh, like if we don't have one, it must be the worship team's fault. It must be the pastor's fault. But this is actually not the case. Your own lack of preparation could be the thing that's hindering you from encountering God's power each time we gather together. I mean, how do you prepare? Same, same way you prepare for that important meeting with your billionaire. Maybe someone's going to meet a billionaire. I don't know why I've got a billionaire in my mind so much. Maybe some of you are going to meet one. But how do you prepare for that meeting? I mean, you steward your, sa your Saturday evening so that you don't stay up late and wake up tired. You want to be fresh when you meet this person. Uh, where possible, you should ensure you have enough domestic support so that you're not overwhelmed on Sunday mornings. I mean, prepare your meals the day before if you can, so you're not waking up tired to make meals for your kids. I remember when our kids were young, my wife got an extra help for Sundays because our helper would take off on Sundays. And we found that we were overwhelmed with three young children and it would kind of cramp our ability to get prepared for church. So we got somebody to come in just for the day to help us with childcare so we could be prepared and have our minds fresh. Uh, have a devotional time on Sunday, Saturday evening or Sunday morning where you actually prepare for church and pray for the service and what God is going to do and how he's going to speak to you. Imagine coming prayed up and you're like, I'm so excited because already I'm, I've been asking God for certain things and I have a feeling today we're having that conversation in church. My goodness. I mean, you, won't, you, you, you will not miss out on what God is going to do. Plan to be in church early. If you have kids, drop them off early so that they can also be ready to worship by the time the service begins. And all these things 
will help you be in an expectant frame of mind that when God begins to move, you're ready for Him. You know what you're really saying in this time? Uh, you need to understand God meets us at the level of our expectation. And when I'm saying, Jesus, it's not about me. It's about you. I don't want to follow myself and my preferences. I want to follow you. And you know something? It's almost being able to say to God, God, I give up my freedom. You know, because I, 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 there are things I like, but I'm saying, God, I give those up. You have an agenda for me when I come to church. And I want to give up that freedom. And when I do, here's a powerful thing. It says, this is a song that we sing at Bavuno. It says, giving up my freedom, I find freedom. So I've got my friends, Pastor Riga from Mavuno downtown. Great to have you. Pastor Natasha from Mavuno Lovington. Awesome to have you guys. And hey, I want us to sing this song because it's a song that many people here know. It's a Mavuno worship song. But I really love this song because it says, giving up my freedom, I find freedom. And I want you to welcome you at home to sing this song with us because really what we're saying is we're expressing to God the kind of worshippers we want to be. Not self-centered worshippers, but Jesus-centered worshippers. Amen. Giving up my freedom. Giving up my freedom, I find freedom, free to follow you. Laying down, laying down my idols, I surrender, I'm made holy. You. Giving up. Giving up my freedom, I find freedom, free to follow you. Laying down my idols, laying down my idols, I surrender, I'm made holy. You be a fool to gain the world and lose my soul. I choose you, I choose you. Only you. We're declaring, Jesus, you're the one. Jesus, you're the one I follow. I give you my today, tomorrow. Forever, Lord. Forever, Lord, I promise to take my cross and follow you. Jesus, you're the one. Jesus, you're the one I follow. I give you my today, tomorrow, forever, Lord, forever, Lord, I promise to take my cross and follow you. I'll take my cross. I'll take my cross and follow I will take my cross. I'll take my cross and follow We will carry our crosses. I'll take my cross and follow you. What an amazing declaration. God's people, corporate worship defeats idolatry. And you know what we've said is we lay down our idols. It's no longer going to be about my convenience, about what I like. It's about what does God intend for me. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now, as the day of His returning is drawing near. Hey, we can't... We, Neglecting meeting together is making ourselves vulnerable. Vulnerable to the, to the attack of the enemy. Vulnerable to our own egos. That's what we're really saying here. That's what the author of, say, of Hebrews is saying. He's saying, don't do that. It's not good for you. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with personal worship. Don't get me wrong. It's a good thing. We must all learn to worship God in the privacy of our homes. All the great men and women of God did that. But something powerful happens when we come together regularly in corporate worship. There's just a special way that God moves us from our personal preference to meeting Him on His terms. And my prayer is that this coming season, you will commit yourself to engage more intentionally in corporate worship. I pray that the Lord will just give you an anticipation that like David, you will be glad when they say to you, let's go into the house of the Lord. Amen. I want to just pray for us. Father, thank you so much for your people today. Thank you for this word that you've given us. Lord, I confess that even I have not always been as committed and passionate about gathering together with God's people. And that many of us, Lord, are in that same place where we've not taken seriously gathering together with God's people for whatever reason. But Lord Jesus, you're teaching us that somehow when we come together with others, 
our faith moves from being me-centered to God-centered because it's no longer just about me and my preferences. I pray that, Lord Jesus, you would help us. Forgive us, Lord, for, for our foolishness. Forgive us for our self-centeredness. Deliver us from our idols. And Lord, as we've sung in this song, we are laying down those idols today. And we're saying, Lord, it's no longer about us and what we want. It's about you and becoming more and more like you. I pray, Lord, for a fresh joy, a fresh freedom over your people. I pray that, Lord, you would give us a desire for communal worship. Some of us are at home because we, can't, we have no choice. We're in a country where it's impossible to meet with other believers. But some of us are in a place where it's not hard to come to a Mavuno church. It's not hard for you to find your family physically, uh, whether it's on Sunday or on, in the weekdays uh, in a discipleship group. And I pray that, Lord, you would give us just an anticipation. Let this word just dislodge that place, that space we've been in and move us back into the place you want us to be. And so, Lord, I just want to thank you and honor you. Thank you for this series. You're teaching us to worship you. And I pray that, Lord Jesus, next week as we conclude this series, we just pray that even between now and then, that, Lord, your presence will be upon us. As we read the Psalms this week, as we worship you this week, that, Lord Jesus, every time we come with expectation into your presence, we will encounter you. And, Lord, in encountering you, we'll find freedom. And so I bless you, God's people, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together, Amen. Amen.